My name is Joshua Pines. Somehow, I don't know how this happened over the years, I acquired the title of color scientist. Hopefully, you know, if we're involved early enough, we're involved in the look development. The cinematographer will come in with the colorist, sit down, and a lot of times they would have reference material, not just, oh, I want it to look like this movie, but, you know, photography, fashion photography, National Geographic, you know, art. Every single time, if there's ever art involved, there's always a picture by Hopper. I don't know what it is about Hopper, but, you know, his paintings, it, they look like really well-lit film sets. If there is a desire for a very, very either strong look or specific look, the early main example for that was uh, Aviator. And there was a very, very clear idea from the director and the DP, because this was a period piece, but they wanted the film to look like the movies that were in release at the time. So it started very early on, and so the only color there was a uh, two-strip two-strip technicolor, there were actually only two colors involved. And then as the timeline progresses, at some point it switches into three-strip technicolor. You know, so it was really interesting. Uh, they started trying to do it, you know, just, oh, we have a color corrector, right, as knobs, so we could just make it look like that. Well, you can do an incredible amount of stuff with those knobs and dials, but there are some things that can't. And so we got old prints, you know, two-strip and three-strip technicolor prints. There were conversations with some of the people involved and in the chemistry of the old Technicolor processes, a lot of research. Actually doing matches for them, coming up, emulating digitally the entire process and workflow of what happened with all those black and white separations and the filtration and the chemistry that was involved with that. And so we were able to actually digitally recreate that analog photochemical process. 50% of it, it's the lighting, the lenses, the makeup, the set design. It's not just the viewing transform, it's not just the lookup table. You know, that, that a lookup table or turning a knob in a color corrector isn't gonna do that. One of the more memorable for a number of reasons. Uh, experiences were the three films in a row that we did with uh, Chivo, Emmanuel Lebeski. The first one was Gravity, a very, very heavy visual effects film. The next two films, which were Birdman and Revenant, those were much more involved in terms of doing look development. The colorist was Steve Scott. There was a lot of work with really going after specific film looks, even if a lot of that was not shot on film. You know, one of the interesting things is there's a starting point for look development. The starting point for look development is not, well, here's a look that looks really good. I want to modify, you know, and it, because anything that looks really good is destructive. The camera's shooting all this extra dynamic range, has a wide color gamut, and to make it look good, if you just looked at that, it looks very flat. It looks very flat, desaturated. I know that may be counterintuitive, but so in order to make it look good, we're you know up in the contrast, rolling off the highlights, sort of constraining the color gamut, and so you know we're sculpting it. It's almost like if you think of a block of marble, start with that you know the flat, low con, desat look, and let's start dialing it in towards where we want it to. We discovered that. I mean, this wasn't like, you know, handed down or etched in stone. If that work is done early on and then provided so that they're seeing that on set or in dailies, if it's a film show, so that, you know, right away they're dialed into that, 
and everyone is seeing that, you know, because this is one of the things, people fall in love with their dailies. If those don't look good, that's what goes into editorial, that's what the previews are made of, that's what the director, and that's what people are looking at for days, if not weeks. People fall in love with their dailies. They come in for the final grading and we show them stuff that looks so much better and they go, yeah, it just doesn't look like my dailies. You know, the cinematographers had a partner in crime at the film labs, that was the color timer or, or color grader. And there was a relationship there about, I'm shooting this a little overexposed, I want you to print it down, add a point of red in this, you know, and there was a language between the cinematographer and the color timer for what the dailies was. Now, as things went digital, dailies were being done on some things with knobs. It wasn't a color timer anymore, you know, it was, and, and so there was no real, you know, marching orders. This is like the early days when digital cameras are coming out. The next day, the cinematographer is looking at us going, what the hell is this? The DPs had lost their ability to control what the dailies looked like. And so working under the auspices of the American Society of Cinematographers, a group of us technical geeks from various facilities is that we got together and we came up with this thing called the CDL, the Color Decision List. It was trying to come up with a language that would give the cinematographers back that ability to talk to the dailies color timer. They'd be able to apply this CDL for dailies or even uh, for visual effects so that everyone, there's a consistent look that had been set by the cinematographer early on. The colorist who's doing the final color correction, they can look at that and then drive it to make it look spectacular. If I only had a nickel for every CDL that was ever made, <laughs>